right, so uh, today we're going to be heading into a recapitulation of the three syntheses, which is probably for the best, given that uh, we've been going over the, the three syntheses in uh, some exceptionally complex ways over <laughs> over a long time. Has it been since we did two, I want to say two, three, it's been two months, a month? It's been two months. Oh my god. So uh, that's six readings uh, since we started getting into the syntheses in this. So. It's going to be a fun one for us to dive into. Let's uh, give a reading to the recapitulation of the three syntheses. Stupefying Oedipus. Inexhaustible and ever-present. We are told that the father died over a period of thousands of years. Well, well. And that the internalization corresponding to the paternal image was produced during the Paleolithic right up until the start of the Neolithic, approximately 8,000 years ago. One analyzes historically, or one doesn't, but honestly, as to the death of the father, news doesn't travel very fast. It would be a mistake to embark Nietzsche on that particular voyage through history, for Nietzsche is not the kind to ruminate over the death of the father, and spend all his Paleolithic period internalizing him. On the contrary, Nietzsche is exceedingly tired of all these stories revolving around the death of the father, the death of God, and wants to put an end to the interminable discourses of this nature, discourses already in vogue in his Hegelian epoch. Alas, he was wrong. The discourses have continued, but Nietzsche wanted us, finally, to pass on to serious things. He gives us twelve or thirteen versions of the death of God, for good measure and to be done with it, so as to render the event comical. As he explains that, strictly speaking, this event has no importance whatever, and it merely concerns the latest pope. God dead or not dead, the father dead or not dead, it amounts to the same thing, since the same psychic repression and the same social repression continue unabated here in the name of God or a living father, there in the name of man or the dead father. Um, my first reaction, anyone who was in our <laughs> logic of sense discussion yesterday, there's literally a sentence about how the statement God is or God is not is the same thing ultimately in sense meaning. And that as I was reading this last night prepping, I couldn't help but sort of call back to that. Does anyone have any thoughts on this paragraph? Any questions? Because I, I don't want to just step directly in. Uh, obviously, we're here talking about Nietzsche and the father and all of these things over historicity. But uh, please, anyone. I think actually a rather big thing is being said here, right? Because the question that Nietzsche is asking is, you know, now that we don't have God, you know, what possible meaning can there to be there to fill the void or whatever, you know, what rituals can we construct, blah, 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 etc. Won't go over all of Nietzsche here. But I, I think it's funny that Deleuze and Guattari are kind of saying, what do you mean that Oedipal was there the whole time? We're just going to fall back on the father yet again. Yeah, it's it's a it's it's essentially a paragraph of that where it's just sort of, mocking the idea of the death of God. Oh, again, excellent. Uh, when is the, you know, uh, almost you want to say, uh, God is dead, long live God, kind of thing happening constantly through this. Sorry, just something also about the translation. It's interesting because um, there's the last word missing in the English version. Uh, the French version actually says, uh, or the dead father interiorized. Also very good. I My assumption was that, uh, there in the name of man or the dead father. I was assuming that it was a reference to the interiorized version, but that's, man, this translation sometimes. This is a bit of a, a subtle point, but I think we're going to see it uh, develop in this section. But if we go all the way back to section one or chapter one, section two, right? They talk, they talk about the master of the syllogism, right? The second synthesis and the role of, um, uh, they kind of play on Kant as like uh, discussing God as the master of that syllogism, right, of noumena. So it's a point about the second synthesis and distribution. So when they, they make the point about the father here, uh, we, we saw this a little bit in the two sections ago, but we'll see this come up here, right? They're starting to play in part here, at least as I'm reading it, I'm focusing on them playing on the second um paralogism and the way that something like the law of the father um, is sort of hanging over us in this sense. But also, how do we move on to serious things, right? No, I, I 
agree. It's a, it's a great way to start off. Again, we're, we've just finished discussing significantly how Oedipus sort of works within the unconscious and how it's working over time and all of that. And uh, this is where they start in on this, uh, diving right into Nietzsche uh, and Deleuze's reading of him. Uh, unless there's a thought, I will continue to the next paragraph. Nietzsche says that what is important... Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry, I was reading the chat. Uh, Nietzsche says that what is important is not the news that God is dead, but the time this news takes to bear fruit. Here, the psychoanalyst perks up his ears, believing he has heard a familiar chord. It is well known that the unconscious takes a lot of time to digest a bit of news. One can even quote some texts of Freud on the unconscious being ignorant of time, conserving its objects like an Egyptian tomb. But that is not at all what Nietzsche is saying. He does not mean that the death of God spends a long time plodding around in the unconscious. He means that it takes so long in coming to consciousness is the news that death of the death of God makes no difference to the unconscious. The fruits of this news are not the consequences brought about by the death of God, but this other news, that the death of God is of no consequence. In other terms, that God and the Father never existed, or if they did, it was so long ago, perhaps during the Paleolithic. All they did was kill a dead man from time immemorial. The fruits of the news of the death of God do away with the flower of his death as well as the bud of his life. For, alive or dead, it is still a question of belief. The element of belief has not been abandoned. The announcement of the father's death constitutes a last belief, a belief by virtue of non-belief about which Nietzsche says, this violence always manifests the need for a belief, for a prop, for a structure. Oedipus as structure. I'm going to guess that structure and my shitty PDF has a P in there, and I just made an ass of myself. Just a guess. Also, I'm going to invent a word, structure. So I'm going to say that's a Delusian term from here out, and that's the way that goes. Is that like strep throat? I'm going to assume it is, or a stropper, a strop uh, that you used to shave with. I think he's making a, a comment about difference in cleaving. That's how I'm going to justify it in some paper I'll write on some shitty website. Maybe I'll make a YouTube video. The structure of cleaving or cleavage, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so... Uh, one of the things that's really important here, and I actually think I am going to go back to a little bit of our discussion of logic and sense yesterday, because it does very much follow from a lot of that. When we start with the idea, we have two statements, God is or God is not. Deleuze writes in Logic of Sense that ultimately our sense of these two statements doesn't really shift, because they're both predicated on the idea and the creation of God as a as a thing, as a, as a place that we're starting from. Uh, the argument inside of this paragraph and the previous one is very, very similar to this. The idea that essentially by invoking God, by talking about God, by bringing him into the structure at all, you're actually creating the structure of God inside of what you're talking about. This is uh, the argument that has been made over the last few uh, sections as well about how representation works with Oedipus, that by starting with Oedipus, by having the conversation, the structure of it necessarily belies itself being introduced into desire. So uh, this sort of odd uh, reversal that they're trying to make here and his take on Nietzsche follows this, that it is not that we are out to kill God. It's not that, oh, God also sort of never existed. It's like, no, no, it's they never existed. We have now tried to kill a dead man, but we can't like... He, the zombie of Oedipus or the zombie of God cannot go away because it's the virtue of non-belief. The idea that we're still discussing it, the structure of such a thing does not go away itself. It's a really fantastic reversal of the thing. This is how I, I read this, and I could not help but connect it to our discussions yesterday in Logic of Sense. Is that yeah, far up? Nothing, far up? nothing to Thank add you. from my side. I read it the same way. Yeah, and this reinforces what they've been talking about in terms of Oedipus not having been produced by the unconscious, right? That is to say, like, everything happening in terms of the syntheses and that, it didn't depend on God in this sense, right? So everything's still happening, right? But in terms of uh, the structure, right, through the, the belief by virtue of non-belief, 
yeah, we're still kind of um, finding this uh, the structure present, but that's not necessarily how things, um, it's, that wasn't necessarily produced by uh, the unconscious, right? Yes, and I think that's, we're going to get a lot into this quite a bit later as we get into uh, how things are produced and how representation is made. But uh, the lines here that are incredibly important to be able to fully uh, understand is uh, the conception that how to, I'm going to try to find the exact line. One sec. Oh, uh, there, it's, sorry, it's the bottom of, uh, what is that? 10, 106. Uh, he means that what takes so long in coming to consciousness is the news that the death of God makes no difference to the unconscious. Uh, the idea that the underlying sort of uh, actual being, it doesn't matter to. It, uh, the, the idea of God is, is almost irrelevant because it's just doing its own thing and it's dealing with representation after the fact. The, it takes a while to come to consciousness that this doesn't matter at all. Really love that sentence. Well, and if I follow too, like if, if that's the case, right, the death of God is equally um, scant. Right. If, if if this is you know if this is kind of what God is in the sense, then the death of God is equally kind of um, a paucity in of itself. Right. It doesn't really have any. I, I, this must. I, I I take it this is kind of a joke on Hegel that they're they're taking each plane. Right. Is like the death of God doesn't have that significance in the first place. Right. Yeah. And uh, again, it's not so much that the death of God is a thing that happened, but that like. And their joke that he killed it 13 times almost to make it comical, uh, again, to drive that point further home. Um, any thoughts before I move on to what is going to start becoming a little bit more complex on this? Because these are, those are the two thoughts that we got to make sure everyone gets before we move on. So if you have questions, the rest of this is going to start getting really wild. So Ingalls paid homage to the genius of Bakofen for having recognized in myth the figures of the maternal and a paternal law, their struggles and their relationships. But Ingalls slips in a reproach that changes everything. It really seems as if Bakofen believed all, believes all this, that he believes in myths in the Furies, Apollo, and Athena. The same reproach applies even better to psychoanalysts. It would seem that they believe in all of this, in myth, in Oedipus, in castration. They reply, uh, the question is not one of knowing whether we believe in this, but whether or not the unconscious itself believes in it. But what is this unconscious when reduced to the state of belief? Who injects it with belief? Psychoanalysis cannot become a rigorous discipline unless it accepts putting belief in parentheses, which is to say a materialist reduction of Oedipus as an ideological form. It is not a matter of saying that Oedipus is a false belief, but rather that belief is, a necessarily, is necessarily something false that diverts and suffocates effective production. That is why seers are the least believing of men. When we relate desire to Oedipus, we are condemned to ignore the productive nature of desire. We condemn desire to vague dreams or imaginations that are merely conscious expressions of it. We relate it to independent existences, the father, the mother, the begitters, that do not yet comprise their elements as internal elements of desire. The question of the father is like that of God. Born of an abstraction, it assumes the link to be already broken between man and nature, man and the world, so that man must be produced as man by something exterior to nature and to man. On this point, Nietzsche makes a remark completely akin to those of Marx or Engels. We now laugh when we find man and world placed beside one another, separated by the sublime presumption of that little word, and. So they, they sound staunchly anti-theism. So like theism places whatever you want to fill in for the principle of God outside of nature, so-called nature, right? Um, whereas panatheism sort of puts it in connection with nature, and then you have like so-called paganism where I guess we could substitute divine for the virtual here and suggest that it's imminent to nature. 
So were they were they uh, staunch atheists or are they just really against Oedipus as some sort of figment of God? Uh, not a thing I think that was discussed in the same way that we might today. So I think it's difficult to utilize the words, uh, but I think um, so. I have a severe distaste of the word atheist because it implies the same ideological assumptions, I believe, as theism. Um, there is, a, it's the line that I adore here, very specifically, is that belief itself, belief itself is the thing. Uh, the phrasing they use, uh, it is not a matter of saying that Oedipus is a false belief, but rather that, quote, to quote direct, belief is necessarily something false that diverts and suffocates effective production. Uh, the representation, and here it's Oedipus, can be God, can be atheism, can be pantheism, can be, I don't care, it can be any of these things, like any sort of large-scale representation of this sort of what you might call a master signifier, I guess, under Lacanian terms, but it could be a lot of other things. Like, that's the problem itself, like, just, just the belief, and I think uh, atheism has that problem significantly. So I'm not sure they would ever, I would assume they would actually make the comment, probably Deleuze would wryly say, I actually believe I'm extremely religious, or some stupid shit like that that's kind of smarmy and kind of funny. But I like that point a lot, the point about belief and it being closely tied to this structure of Oedipus. Um, it, there's this one essay that I've read and it talked about this, and, you know, it, it's almost too hard for me to believe my belief alone like i need i need to ape it or something and i need you to believe it too and in this way i'm like suggesting that my representation my belief is the thing you know um oh i, I would i would go a step further and say the challenge is not that the my belief is is the thing it's a thing the, the the challenge with any semblance of representation is by doing such you've concretized it and the thing they're talking about here sort of throughout this, you know, God and Oedipus and all of that, they're using as examples here, but it's determinate. And the challenge with this, as they say, is, and they kind of laugh about it, the, we laugh now when we find man and world. The, the reason we laugh or the reason that these are problems is the moment we've uh, brought God or some sort of abstracted reality of what uh, man is, We've actually, by doing so, removed ourselves as part of the world, implicitly, by doing such a thing. So, by saying that I am needing some abstracted thing that is not uh, concretized or materialist, uh, the, this is their argument here for a materialist reduction of Oedipus, uh, if I'm doing anything that doesn't have a materialist connection, by nature, I've disconnected and assumed that man is not part of the world. If man is part of the world, then we don't need those abstractions in order to be deterministic. I give, you know, I don't really understand the term abstract machine very well, but it doesn't seem like they use it in a derogatory term. So, so are we talking about the mere fact of abstraction here being alienated, alienating, or is it like, you know, usurping people's ability to spontaneously create abstractions through connecting with anything. Well, I, I mean, we're going to come to kind of explain more of that, but the I would not say they're necessarily even against representation or uh, like against Oedipus or against God. Like these, the that conception again assumes uh, when they're talking about it here, uh, the phrasing that they use. Um, uh, Seers are the least believing of men. When we relate desire to Oedipus, we are condemned to ignore the productive desire, nature of desire. We condemn desire to vague dreams or imaginations that are merely conscious expressions of it. We relate it to independent existences, the father, the mother, the begetters, that do not yet comprise their elements as internal elements of desire. By playing with these things and talking about things that are determinate and structured, that are not connected to a materialist version of this. When we can talk about, in Oedipus, for example, mother, father, me, but I'm not talking about my mother, I'm not talking about my father, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about the conceptions of those. And those conceptions don't actually comprise my experience, the, the internal elements of my desire, they're not part of that. 
So when I start having to deal with that, I'm actually forced and, and, and implicitly forced uh, by going down this road to integrate my desires into Oedipus, to sort of force them into that space rather than, oh, well, I'm, well, Oedipus really isn't for me. I don't really have the problem wanting to fuck my mom. Oh, no, you do. You just don't know yet kind of thing is the, is the response. Uh, because, again, it's not playing with the things that are directly connected to my desire. It's implicitly assuming the other side. This is, again, how I take it. And I, this is this is the stuff I really love the discussion of because this is where I think the most interesting parts of this book are, is playing with how representation functions. Yeah, that's some um, Inception-level shit move. <laughs> and a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we'll, we'll definitely come back to that, Ken. And if we don't, uh, let's make sure we talk about it afterwards for sure. Uh, does anyone have any questions on this paragraph? I just wanted to point out that uh, when you're having this discussion, right, it's not so much about like, uh, there's an important distinction they're making that the, the quote Brooks read is actually um, really useful for seeing, right? Is that they're talking about the unconscious versus the conscious here, right? So like uh, what Brooks read was, um, it is a matter of saying that Oedipus, is, it is not a matter of saying that Oedipus is a false belief, but rather, shoot, I just lost it. They, they were talking about it in terms of consciousness and I moved my finger, but uh, that's, that was the point I wanted to highlight is they're talking about the difference between outright, as you said, between between consciousness and and un, the unconscious is what you're saying, Jack. Oh no, did we just lose Jack? Oh no. Let us hope that is what he was trying to say. <laughs> I, I, I think I think that's what he was saying, and I'm I he's completely right. That's uh, they're talking basically about the difference between unconscious desire and sort of conscious, you know, experience or whatever. It uh, we're going to be getting a lot more into that, but they're definitely drawing that line. A conscious belief and unconscious desire. I think Jack lost his mic, which is fine. Uh, sadly, he'll have to talk. He'll have to type, and that's a shame. Um, uh, any questions though on this? Because uh, I know I've, uh, it's a lot said in this paragraph. There's a lot said in this paragraph. Did can you hear me? Okay. There you are. Now that's strange. Um... But I found the passage, when we relate desire to Oedipus, we are condemned to ignore the productive nature of desire. We condemn desire to vague dreams or imaginations that are merely conscious expressions of it. We relate it to independent ex existences, the father, mother, begetters, that do not comp yet comprise the elements as internal elements of desire. Right. So yeah, that was the big thing I was trying to highlight is if you put it into belief, right, you're talking about consciousness and there's a point about how you're talking about things that are sort of separated from the unconscious in a weird way, right? But they're supposed to affect the unconscious and how it produces. But of course, the problem there is going to be that the unconscious doesn't believe in these things, right? Because for the unconscious, belief is irrelevant, right? It's just producing because desire doesn't know belief. I will uh, move on. I... Please, if anyone has a, a question, don't hesitate. Raise your hand, you know, unmute yourself, uh, type it in chat. We're here to answer everything. This is about understanding, and we're in, I think, this is, if there is a thesis of this book that is extremely important to take away, it's this section and the things that it implies, which are going to become significantly, significantly more important for you to understand as we move into uh, uh, Chapter 3. Uh, because this is kind of a lot of their critique of a lot of stuff, to say the least. Yeah, I, I can pose a question for our friend uh, Ken. I'm just curious here because there seems to be like uh, something of an implicit reference to Jung. Like, do you think Jung, do you think there's a fair criticism there that um, something like a dream and the way that uh, that's dealt with in something like analytic psychology maybe actually looks at the conscious rather than the unconscious or do you do you think there's a, a useful criticism there i mean yeah so the criticism would be that consciousness 
uh, or that the unconscious compensates for what um, is excluded in the social relationship that consciousness is embedded in. So the represent representations that you use for a social relationship um, end up excluding something. And then that exclusion reappears in things like dreams and getting triggered and, and like, you know, reactions and stuff like that. Um, so in, in so far as they critique that sort of function uh, of compensation, then they would have a direct line of disagreement critique with Jung. Um, but in so far as consciousness deals with representations, and and the unconscious doesn't necessarily know of discernible forms per se, um, then they'd be in agreement. Like like consciousness for young is that it, the I, is the faculty of identification, identity, drawing boundaries, representing things. Um, whereas, yeah, the unconscious is like an admixture of desire uh, between complexes with ha which have some sort of like fractal dimension where each one is not without the other. So like this, this, so like speaking of like the father archetype and the mother archetype is nonsense um, in, in terms of like trying to talk about uh, what's going on with the unconscious. That's all conscious representation and, and excluding differences of the archetype to discern a form. Um, so, so, and it sounds like Deleuze and Guattari critique that, and I like that a lot because I like Jung and I feel like his uh, stuff is being drugged through the mud. I don't know if I answered your question. I hope I did. Yeah, I think so. Cause I enjoy his work too, but that the the point they seem to be making, right, is there's something about the Jungian method, and, and it's not just Jung, is it? Like this extends beyond him, but there's sort of a a problem in methodology here, where if we focus on the the analyst and like consciousness to understand the unconscious, right, then we're not really understanding the unconscious on its own terms, right? And I do think Jung has work trying to deal with it on its own terms, but. Uh, we can definitely say that there's some methodological risk for him and certainly for other uh, psychoanalysts, right? Yeah, the methodological risk is uh, is impugning representations and dreams with intention. So suggesting that this image has this formulaic meaning and it's this intention. Like that's the slippery slope with Jung. Um, when what you're looking for are symmetry breakings. You're looking for the navel of the dream where representation fails. Um, you aren't looking for similarity. Like, yeah. Um, but I think the very helpful criticism is, uh, is like thinking that the unconscious is prima facie mythological. When, when... Um, when the theogonic process is a pre-conscious process, like there is a theogonic, you know, that we, we move through periods in time with like, uh, with principles that we raise above all else. And maybe you can call them, uh, God principles, but like from Plato. So Plato had a positive movement at the end. Aristotle had God at the end as the telos, as the terminus. Um, but that's a, that's a pre-conscious thing. That's not this weird, infinite judgment, unconscious area where, um, where you can't say that what's happening in the unconscious is a movement from Uranus to Kronos to Zeus, right? I like that. I'm, I'm going to turn it back to Brooks so we can continue the reading, but. The, the thing that sticks out to me there is it almost sounds like we're understanding con the unconscious through the conscious, right? And then part of the methodological problem is that, and they'll, they'll get into this later, right? This creates kind of a, a, a loop of focusing on the pre-conscious, right? 
So you never get to the unconscious and full. You kind of just focus on what's going to come into consciousness by focusing on what's conscious and trying to kind of reproduce it. Yeah. Um, so, uh, James asked, uh, uh, I believe it was James, how does the Oedipal structure relate to platonic representation? Uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, to the group, is this worth spending a moment going over, or is this the kind of thing I should say we're about to be explaining more of, and we'll get to it later? I feel like that's a better answer, but I wanted to ask if anyone had a quick way to maybe answer this now, that might be a good call. I guess the easy thing is like the platonic model. So it's not necessarily like they're not talking about a question of looking for the form of Oedipus, right? They're talking about the structure of Oedipus that leads to belief. So it's not exactly a platonic problem, but it would more so be like the representation here would be kind of what Ken and I were just talking about, where the it's more so the structure is being put into a question of consciousness and belief, and that's supposed to speak for the unconscious, right? And so what you only end up dealing with is consciousness and the pre-conscious. Um, so you end up kind of occluding what you're supposed to be investigating, right? The unconscious, and yet you're sort of speaking for it through the structure of Oedipus. We'll, we'll be able to get to it a little bit more in depth. I think it's worth, let's get through, and then at the end, uh, just make a note and re-ask. I think that'd probably be the best call. I'm going to continue the, the reading. Uh, coextensiveness is another matter entirely. The coextension of man and nature, a circular movement by which the unconscious, always remaining subject, produces and reproduces itself. The unconscious does not follow the paths of a generation progressing or regressing from one body to another, your father, your father's father, and so on. The organized body is the subject of reproduction by generation. It is not its subject. The sole subject of reproduction is the unconscious itself, which holds to the circular form of production. Sexuality is not a means in the service of generation. Rather, the generation of bodies is in the service of sexuality as an autoproduction of the unconscious. Sexuality does not represent a premium for the ego in exchange for its subordination to the process of generation. On the contrary, generation is the ego's solace, its prolongation, the passage from one body to another through which the unconscious does no more than reproduce itself in itself. Indeed, in this sense, we must say the unconscious has always been an orphan. That is, it has engendered itself in the identity of nature and God of the world and man. The question of... <clears throat> sorry. The question of the Father, the question of God, is what has become impossible, a matter of indifference. So true is it that to affirm or deny such a being amounts to the same thing or to, live it, lo to love it or kill it, one and the same misconception concerning the nature of the unconscious. So their, their use of sexuality here, I think, is, uh, again, really bringing up the, the reversal they're trying to make and the one they're trying to really push on people. Sexuality is not a means uh, in service of a generation. No, a generation of bodies is in the service of sexuality as an autoproduction of the unconscious. The reversal there being the interesting part as we start talking about all of this. Uh, any comments, questions? This might be helpful. When they're talking about sexuality here, they don't necessarily mean a question of like uh, the heterosexual, the bisexual, the home. Like they're not really getting at that, which is a little bit more, uh, sometimes a little bit more traditional in, in psychoanalysis, right? They're talking about sexuality in terms of the unconscious and its auto production, its self-production, as opposed to sexuality being like used by the unconscious to to produce things. So it's it's a little bit of a play, but the 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 point I'm trying to make is that with sexuality, they're not talking about like a human sexuality in the service of generation. They're talking about the sexuality that the unconscious is producing itself through or autopoiesis. Yeah, sexuality is not 
uh, wording here. Um, libidinal desire, uh, sexuality, that kind of thing uh, is what they mean. Uh, again, it's it's what they talked about at the beginning, uh, the way that desire functions within the unconscious. Uh, commonly thought by Freud that sort of... Uh, uh, that generation, the 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 production of it, the production of energy, the production of libido, um, uh, has sexuality sort of in its service to carve a path for it to move forward. That's an awkward phrasing, but I think not a terribly wrong one, as how Fre Freud sort of classified it, and a lot of other people as well. Uh, the idea that kind of there is uh, this big generation happening the sexuality helps carve out and and shape our desires sexuality shapes the desires in the service of generation he's like no no generation of bodies is in the service of sexuality as an auto production of the unconscious sexuality does not represent a premium for the ego in exchange for support on the contrary generation is the ego's solace its prolongation the passage from one body to another uh, so that's the reversal as i understand it maybe awkwardly put can we say sexuality for Deleuze and Guattari is the three syntheses? Libido. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask Michael, in the original text, do they say, is it sexuality? Or what is the word they actually have in there? Sorry, I'm calling you out, French person. Uh, for for sexuality in English? Uh, yeah. Have, um... Um, the generation of the body that is at the service of the of sexuality is it the sentence? Yes, correct. Sorry, I need to press the button for it to work. Uh, yes, um, uh, it's the generation of the body that is at the service of sexuality as auto production of the unconscious, and the word is sexuality. Yeah, it's so odd. Their language gets so confusing. Um, but yeah, I think I think Ken's right. So, it's there. Yeah, like, go ahead. Sorry, the question I had uh, was also, um, what do they mean by generation of the bodies? Do they mean like producing um, children? That's sort of what they're. Oh, go ahead, try it. Or do they uh, mean uh, bodies in another way? I guess in you could almost say in both sense because these uh, this this. Um, sentence the organized body is the object of reproduction by generation it is not its subject reads to me like um the the organized body is constantly made through um sexuality and through reproduction so it is not an active agent in in this sort of sense but sexuality is this is this drive that is constantly uh, expressing and reproducing itself through bodies right that's interesting. Uh, the question I have also is, um, so both uh, the sentences actually I highlighted, <laughs> um, because at the beginning it says the organized body is the object of uh, reproduction by generation, but then it says generation of bodies in the plural. So is the organized body and generation of bodies um, the same thing? If I make any sense, because um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think the the play they're making is that um, so like there's a way of talking about sexuality as unconsciously as unconsciously directed toward like a telos, right? Toward the production or like reproduction of people, right? So sexuality is supposed to be um generative in the sense of generating children or something like that right um the move that they're making is one to say that sexuality is not anthropomorphic so this means that like uh, me putting my lid on my teapot has a certain sexuality that's not dependent on me right because it's a sexuality producing the assemblage of the teapot myself and its lid Right, so sexuality is coming before me altogether because it's producing me, the teapot, and that lid in the assemblage, right? 
And so in that sense, it's generating um, both itself as the unconscious and that subjectivity, right? So this goes, this is why I like the, the time with the three syntheses you guys are making because the, the distribution of the functions and the way we're coming together, that is produced by sexuality in a non-human sense. And yeah, their use... Makes th sense to me. Uh, just to follow up on what Tried was saying, and I because I really like their use here of uh, the idea of using generations in that, you know, sort of almost double, uh, almost a double entendre, where they're saying the generation progressing, where one body to another, your father, your father's father, and so on. It's it's not they're saying that it's not so much I as I read it. Let me let me try. Uh, it's not so much that I made a kid and then that kid made a kid, uh, and uh, I am the grandfather. He's the father. That's the the grandson, whatever it may be. But that actually, it's the opposite of that. That the this organization that we call father, child, grandfather, father's father, and all of that is actually being generated itself. The, the the organized body, the organization of this is the object of reproduction. It is not the subject. It is not that I'm creating through my sort of natural state, uh, the father, the grandfather, or the child, or Oedipus, or whatever it may be, but instead that that's actually part of my sort of that larger representation and reproduction that's being happening. It creates that for me. Is that making sense? Yeah, you're broaching the last part of the paragraph, right? Which is, okay, so if the unconscious, if if the teapot falling on the lid, right? If there's not even a person there, if there's a sexuality producing that in terms of the unconscious self-production, how do we get things like the name of the father in Oedipus, right? And I see that, I see you broaching on your question, right? So how do we, were they what they call a misconception, how does this come about? Um, I think I, I, I read it slightly differently, although maybe along the same lines, in that obviously um, an organized body or an organ, right, is, is different from a, a non-organized thing, uh, in that a line of flight, for instance, or the, or the, the, the schizophrenic process doesn't have generations, because that's not generational, it doesn't reproduce, right? The only thing that that would reproduce would be it would be an organ. So it's it's almost. Uh, let me try to use other awkward uh, ways to describe this. Um, the I me my father my father's father are you know uh, things like for sure bodies and and stuff and all kinds of different stuff. Uh, the organization of it by saying such things. Uh, by, by sort of claiming that and claiming us as not only different, but by creating this sort of generational progressing, that is what is being created by representation, by uh, reproduction, uh, by uh, this misconception. Because I, I'm, I'm agreeing with what you're saying. I'm just trying to figure out another way to say it, Webcam Parrot. Because I like, I like how you put it. I'm just trying to figure out another way to say it. Sorry, I cut out a bit when you were explaining it, so I missed some, some of what you were saying. So the, the, the reproduction that's happening, it is not that, uh, and this is uh, so hard for, to figure out how way to say a sort of nicely yeah. out loud. This is not, this is, but this is like the important shit. So I kind of want to spend a second on it. Um, <laughs> the, the creation of God, the creation of me, my father, my father's father, and all of that is not because my dad made me and my dad, like as a subject, uh, created this generative sort of thing. It's the organization of it is the object of the reproduction by the process itself, the process of uh, the representation and how it affects things. So they, I, I, I pull that when they talk about it. Board of Extraction assumes a link already broken. The last few paragraphs seems to pull really at the idea that sexuality is not in service of generation. The generation of bodies is in service as an auto production of the unconscious. That makes it feel like it's almost that everything is everything is sort of oh, fuck i lost it i lost my thread i hate this so much <laughs> um i mean i i suppose what i would say is that, that there's a there's a tendency perhaps to go back to like a biological thing like oh you know generational well the, the father or whatever but what i would uh, what i would say to question here would be that that a biological idea is still an idea that we came up with Right. And so what's being questioned here 
just the structure in which we decide that that is an idea worth talking about in the first place, right? And it, and, it, and it is in this way that it is organized, right? It is an organ or an organized body. And, uh, and so it, and thus only an organized body or a thing that has been organized has the capability to be generational or to reproduce at all, because there's a blueprint now, right? By which to reproduce it. A line of flight does not reproduce because by the very nature of what it is, uh, it, it, it's a boundary breaking, right? Um, and it seems to me that that's what they're at least part perhaps that is one reading of what they're trying to say here is that it is the organized body is itself the object of reproduction by generation right and so you're getting into the tension of the paralogism and the syllogism right where and i'm using the tea the, the teapot but the lid on that right the sexuality involved in that is engaged in that first synthesis and the unconscious production um, thereof, right? That in of itself is the unconscious producing itself right there in that first synthesis of connection, right? And that's since we're talking about like the partial objects and the way the assemblage is happening. And to your point, right, that's different than taking like already formed detached objects, right? Or global persons in the first paralogism to talk about how sexuality functions inversely i think i'm going to force us to come back to this in a moment um because it's I, I, again i i yeah, i'm going to keep moving but this is like like if there is a thing that i want to make sure not only that i grasp but that we're able to again communicate clearly to everyone who's here or who will listen to this like this is the thing this is really important later on and i i think i i grasp it in an intuitive way I'm just having a lot of difficulty talking about it. I really like how you phrased that. Uh, but once again, uh, uh, I, I, I'm with you, and I like how you're putting it. So it's just, uh, yes, Jack, I, I grok it. I just can't explain it. Jack likes that he learned a new word. Uh, he didn't know the word grok. Everyone should know the word grok. It's a good word. I only know the, I call it, oh, sorry. So I'm just making a joke. Don't worry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I only know the alcoholic beverage grok. It's an old old yeah. sci-fi term that means to understand something, uh, for lack of a better word, imminently, without reason, without thought. Ah, gr intuitive understanding. G R O K. Ah, it's okay. uh, I believe it's Robert Heinlein. We were having this discussion earlier about where it comes from. Okay, yeah, so here, grok is just a hot drink out of rum, sugar, and hot water <laughs> no you're not allowed to explain it stop <laughs> <laughs> um all right uh next paragraph um but psychoanalysts are bent on producing man abstractly that is to say ideologically for culture it is oedipus who produces man in this fashion and who gives a structure to the false movement of infinite progression and regression your father and your father's father, a snowball gathering speed as it moves from Oedipus all the way to the father of the primal horde, to God and the Paleolithic age. It is Oedipus who makes us man, for better or for worse, say those who would make fools of us all. The tone may vary, but the message remains basically the same. You will not escape Oedipus. Your sole choice is between the neurotic outlet and the non-neurotic outlet. The tone may be that of the scandalized psychoanalyst. The psychoanalyst is cop. Those who do not bow to the imperialism of Oedipus are dangerous deviants. Leftists, who ought to be handed over to social and police repression. They talk too much and are lacking in anality. Dr. Gerard Mendel, Dr. Stefan. What kind of disquieting play on words is it that can make the analyst a promoter of anality? Or is there the psychoanalyst as priest, the pious psychoanalyst, who is forever chanting the incurable insufficiency of being? Don't you see that Oedipus saves us from Oedipus? It is our agony, but also our ecstasy, depending on whether we live it neurotically or live it structure. It is the mother of the holy faith. J.M. Poyer. Or the techno-psychoanalyst, the reform psychoanalyst obsessed with the triangle who wraps the splendid gifts of civilization inside Oedipus, 
identity, manic depression, and liberty in an infinite progression. Through Oedipus, the individual learns to live the triangular situation, the token of his identity, and at the same time he discovers, sometimes in a depressive mode, sometimes in a mode of exaltation, his fundamental alienation, his irremediable solitude, the price of his liberty. The basic structure of the Oedipal apparatus must not only be generalized in time so as to account for all the triangular experiences of the child and his parents, it must also be generalized in space to include those triangular relations other than parent-child relations. This a pretty easy paragraph. Uh, also, I do like techno-psychoanalyst. Uh, uh, the, really, I do want to make sure I point out the wonderful joke they actually make that's quite good. Uh, I, didn't, I chuckled in my head. Uh, the disquieting play on words it is that can make the analyst a promoter of anality is actually kind of a funny line. Just saying. Um, uh, but if you're super into psychoanalysis, this is basically them saying, fuck it. So it's a short version. For various reasons. Any questions, any thoughts here? In case anyone's interested, that last quotation that concludes the paragraph is from a fellow named Hawkman. All right, well, with that, I'm going to move to the next paragraph. Here we go. This is where it starts getting fun. <sighs> the unconscious poses no problem of meaning, solely problems of use. The question posed by desire is not what does it mean, but rather, how does it work? How do these machines, these desiring machines work, yours and mine, with what sort of breakdowns as a part of their functioning? How do they pass from one body to another? How are they attached to the body without organs? What occurs when their mode of operation confronts the social machines? A tractable gear is greased, or, on the contrary, an infernal machine is made ready. What are the connections? What are the disjunctions? The conjunctions? What use is made of the syntheses? It represents nothing, but... It produces. It means nothing, but it works. Desire makes its entry with the general collapse of the question, what does it mean? No one has been able to pose the problem of language except to the extent that linguists and logicians have first eliminated meaning, and the greatest force of language was only discovered once a work was viewed as a machine, producing certain effects amenable to a certain use. Malcolm Lowry says of his work, <laughs> Really? 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 <laughs> Is that what he says? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a fucking wild, wild philosopher. Give me a second, sorry about that. The coming animal. <laughs> yep. no, no, no. The There you go. Go, go kill whoever that is, I guess. So we can continue, right? Triad, do you want to be Rook. the dog and I'll be Rooks? Stupid dog. <laughs> Goddamn. Oh, okay, in the, in this, the, this sounds... Alphabet. Well, he doesn't... Dog's bark is the, is the stupidest noise in the entire universe. He does. He hates barks. The loose hates barks. He hates dogs, actually, a lot. Jack, this sounds way more kinky than I expected. So, apparently someone uh, is at the front door, so I have no idea. Uh, I oh. believe that's the pizza guy. Yeah, it was a guy on a Segway scooter. I kind of want to throw a rock from my window and hit him. <laughs> um... All right, uh, I will uh, now continue from where I left off, which was actually quite a great line, and I was on a roll. So let's try to start that again. <sighs> Malcolm Lowry says of his work, It's anything you want it to be, so long as it works. Quote, It works too, believe me, as I have found out. A machinery. But on condition that meaning be nothing other than use, that it become a firm principle only if we have at our disposal imminent criteria capable of determining the legitimate uses as opposed to the illegitimate ones that relate use instead of to a hypothetical meaning and reestablish a kind of transcendence. So, great paragraph, uh, despite the doggo. <laughs> Dottie's uh, always excited. Um, the last sentence here is the one that is 
this paragraph uh, summed up very nicely. Uh, basically, uh, we need to, uh, at our disposal, find at our disposal, discover imminent criteria capable of determining legitimate uses as opposed to illegitimate ones that relate use instead to a hypothetical meaning and reestablish a transcendence. Uh, their entire concept here very much boiled down to the idea of classic psychoanalysis and, material psycho mat and uh, materialist psychiatry coming through in this line. I really like it. Um, but I'll leave it open. Any questions, any comments on this? Because I'm going to start talking about it from the top in a moment, but I figure I'll, I'll open it up. The way they are positing meaning other than use uh, sounds pretty pragmatistic to me but yeah I'm, but i'm the purse guy and also it sounds like dewey and james and we all know that the lowest love james especially and um as well as some uxkill i would say because for him it's the same thing that there is no inherent meaning out there but that is produced by action and our um interaction within the world or with the outside world well, to sort of break down just a little bit, because again, um, the three syntheses are passed through here very quickly, uh, because again, they've talked about this throughout this entire book so far, and they've sort of gone over them a few times. And right now they're recapping very quickly why it's necessary for us to understand them. The three syntheses to say again is the connective, uh, disjunctive, and conjunctive. Uh, the first step is connection, which at the same time of connection happening also produces. It's a wonderful little thing. And then there's disconnection, things disconnect. And then there's the conjunction, which is the result of this, the uh, uh, where the subject sort of comes of the entire thing, the sort of uh, gathering of these. Uh, as they say, it represents nothing. Uh, it means nothing. The, the syntheses themselves aren't like a thing that has meaning, that has some greater thing that we're trying to attach to. It's, a, I think, one of the reasons that they very much went in this method. I can't assign uh, any sort of larger scale meaning or God or signification to the disjunction, the connective, and the conjunction, like aside from the words a bit, but not the things. Like, it's very tough. And so as such, it all we can do is talk about how it works. That's it. It's a, what does it produce? How does it, how does it operate? What does it do? Which uh, I think is really great. Am I far off? I'm going to just keep poking. Webcam, how, how, how was what I said? Is it far off? Is it generally good? Do you want to add a little bit? Come on. Seems fine. I don't, I don't know what to say. I, I sometimes try to avoid this grounding ungrounding territory because i don't know where to separate my own thoughts and what derrida thinks and what dillis and gotari think from it that's fair <laughs> let's say i think the best part is we're trying to find the words to communicate things that they said have no meaning and can't really be talked about so it's another reason this part's fun now does anyone have questions let's uh, ask that uh, James, uh, anything here? Michael, Rimka, anyone? Feel free to type in the chat or uh, unmute yourself. We're here to answer. Uh, because a big deal here, again, uh, this paragraph insists on the others, and it's going to be something they're going to call out in the next couple. Uh, imminent criteria. What does imminent criteria mean to this? Postgurd asks. Uh, anyone want to take that? imminent in the way that it, is, it isn't um, on the outside. So it, it, it's most of the time imminent is the counterpart to transcendence. So we have something that is inside of the structure, for example, we are looking at, or when you're analyzing a work of art, you're trying to analyze it most of the time, at least uh, in visual art through its imminent criteria. How is its structure? What is the composition and not um, from the outside? So what did the uh, artist try to express his feelings or it's, is it a commentary on, on the maybe the social political aspect or is it uh, uh, all this stuff like, maybe like Oedipus something from the outside uh, that is giving meaning 
but rather how it is from the inside giving meaning. Uh, Postscript says, so kind of back to the top of the paragraph, meaning of the unconscious is outside of it while its function use is internal and imminent. Um, I, I think to me, I read the, the top of the paragraph as them saying uh, that desire really does not give a shit about meaning. Uh, yeah, like at all, like it's, it could not, like it's, it's, it's the wrong side of the country. This is desires a river here and over there on like another planet maybe is sort of meaning happening. Like it could not matter. doesn't affect it. Uh, instead it's the desires question is, Oh, well, what does this thing do? Uh, think of it like, a like a child. Uh, actually a child is a very good example of a lot of stuff they talk about the child when you introduce a three-year-old to say the president they might say something embarrassing they'll just say hi they don't give a fuck who this person is they know it's a person and they're like oh what what do you do oh and they'd ask like they're really curious and they just want to know about that person but it's like the idea of the queen or the president or these things that it's and the way they phrase it it's uh an illegitimate use that relates use instead to a hypothetical meaning. Oh my, you're going to talk that way to the president? Like, what? No, the person. And then like, uh, how does it work? How do these, how does, how do these things go versus something that is more transcendent that, you know, we're appealing to constantly. And that's a desire just does not give a shit about transcendent stuff. It gets fucked up by transcendent stuff, but it doesn't give a shit about it. I think maybe a, funny, incredibly confusing way to put it would be that although it is true that to desire a thing, I must first know it as in, you know, let's say I want a sandwich. Well, I have to know where the sandwich begins and ends on, on some level. But then after desiring it, I have to know it again, capital K. Yeah, that's actually a really great way to put it too. It, uh, very much. Like a Sven's line, a diamond changes the world around it, yet does nothing. Uh, the value of diamonds, I think, is not a an awkward way to say. Uh, it has a transcendent value. Like, kind of not to me. Like, not to, is not, there's no imminent reason, unless you're making something that requires diamonds in the manufacturing process. That's a different beast. But, like, it has a transcendent value. It's, but what it does is what matters. Desire cares about the use of the diamond for the different things, not... This weird sort of secondary, oh, well, diamonds are a, a lady's best friend. No desire would ever say that yeah, diamonds are a lady's best friend. I'm not even saying that. I'm using it as if because it's a good marketing line. I'll continue then. <sighs> Analysis termed transcendental is precisely the determination of these criteria, imminent to the field of the unconscious, insofar as they are opposed to the transcendent exercises of a what does it mean? Schizoanalysis is at once a transcendental and a materialist analysis. It is critical in the sense that it leads the criticism of Oedipus, or leads Oedipus to the point of its own self-criticism. It sets out to explore a transcendental unconscious rather than a metaphysical one, an unconscious that is material rather than ideological, schizophrenic rather than Oedipal, non-figurative rather than imaginary. imaginary. Real rather than symbolic, machinic rather than structural, an unconscious, finally, that is molecular, microphysical, and micrological rather than molar or gregarious, productive rather than expressive, and it is a matter here of practical principles as directions for the cure. It's a hell of a thing overall to say about analysis that it is uh, ultimately transcendental. Um, and doesn't get at the material reality of anything. Uh, and, oh, God damn it, Boskert. I, I, I knew when I said that someone was going to type it. <sighs> Imaginatory. Uh, Brooks, Brooks Neologism, I guess. God damn it. Again, this paragraph, uh, like the others before it, talking more into what we were just saying about the transcendental. Um, you know, are they opposing non-figurative and imaginary? Isn't it the same thing? Um, <clears throat> I mean, pictures in your imagination can still be figures and can still be abstracted from any realm of experience. 
you know, I, I get into some position of authority and power and sort of just this mere, not the meaning of me being an authority figure or something, but just the, the sensation uh, of that ecological role sort of causes me to self ingratiate and imagine myself as some sort of idealization. And then I can fixate on that image and then it becomes a sort of self fulfilling prophecy. I start acting like the way I imagine myself to be, which is abstracted from the situation. That's a great way of putting it. It's a, uh, it's why they will not say, and they, they've said literally the opposite that there's no such thing as Oedipus. No one's Oedipus. No one wants, it's like, no, it's like these things can still be, people can still be these things. It's just getting away from this transcendental concept that all of us are, or there's some larger thing behind it. And, uh, but Mikhail, I'm guessing by saying we don't have all, we don't all have a figurative imaginary though. Are, are you talking about, um, what is that thing whenever you can't picture things in your imagination? Because it starts with an A. Yeah. A uh, yeah, I think some people don't picture things, I guess. Yeah, so you don't have to for the representation to still work. You can still do all of the same thing on the level of the com on, on the level of the concept. So you can still have a concept of yourself being some sort of kingly figure and living that out, right? And so so I'm gonna ask because now I'm now I'm confused. Um I I do think that they are opposing non-figurative and imaginary imaginary being figurative imaginary is figurative they're saying non-figurative am i wrong on that because it sounds like ken what you were saying is that uh it things are still figurative in their version of the unconscious no well i mean there's a there is well here's where I might diverge from them in that I think concepts are still representations. Mm. If I could uh, cut in here. I, I So I took the imaginary. I, I think that's a suggestion toward Lacan, but the role of figurative language, right? We're talking about, um, I mean, I'll give you a Moseran, right? The most honest thing for a person to do is not to use euphemisms, right? Uh, <laughs> beautiful line. But figurative language in the sense of using metaphors, well, I don't even want to say metaphors, trying to understand things in ter uh, on terms other than its own is what I see them saying here, right? So like with like the imaginary, right? Like uh, to me, it's not so much a question of representation itself, but trying to understand the unconscious um, apart from its own terms, right? Or on the terms of something like consciousness, right? Where you understand consciousness, I'm sorry, where you would understand the unconscious by using consciousness, right? So you create um, a problem here because now you're you're not on, on the unconscious own terms, right? So this, to me, it's not so much about metaphor or, or figurative language being good or bad, but the use of it in trying to understand something apart from itself, right? Yeah, that was a sin of omission on my part. That was just the example that immediately came to mind. And 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 yeah, I mean, narcissism isn't necessarily the unconscious, right? Like, like forming an, a representation of things or or investing libido into yourself isn't necessarily on that level of the unconscious the, the unconscious in that is that um is that unrepresent is is that repetition that can't be represented to itself or or is that that difference that i've been reading about but the unconscious isn't that like you have this store of images that can um that can be collateral with like ecological roles no that sort of comes as a as a pre-conscious cycle thing i'm sorry if that was nonsense 
No, no, it's a, I mean, it's a different, I mean, we, and we've talked about this, Ken, I think we diverge in very few ways. And, uh, I mean, I diverge in my own ways from all these texts in different ways as well. This is just one of those where I'm like, no, so, because to me, it's, they're being very particular here that they're talking about the non-figurative and they're, uh, they're like, this this is us we're not talking about figures of things we're not talking about archetypes we're not talking about any of this shit we're talking about an unconscious that's actually materialist that 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 we're able to break down to the point where we can say here is how desire uh is produced here's how things work here's how things are interacting uh almost as if it were as if we were saying i can see how the blood is moving through the human body and i can understand how a person through their neurons believes they exist we're talking about that level of almost material reality versus the conception of classic psychoanalysis that is uh, maybe you exist you've got a bunch of shit dancing around on a stage in your head and it's a big mass of stuff rolling around and uh, we're gonna figure out how to get the right stuff on stage so that way you can be a good citizen kind of thing yeah so i think where we're diverging is on this idea of material I don't, I don't read the, their idea of material being a materialist metaphysics, like of material as we commonly understand it as being a substance. Like they have the actual and the virtual, right? And those are both real. Yes, I, I don't think I mean literally material in that sense either. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I the, the body thing threw me off. In the no, uh, and no but, but, but it, like it's not literally things I can grab or whatever. But it. Op but my point is that we're able to say here is how thing A operates. Here's the systemic realities of it, and we're able to see here's how stuff bounces off of it. The same way I might be able to in Minecraft. Like Minecraft's not real either, but there's rules, there's setups, there's a materialist reality to it that we're able to sort of play around with, and I can actually see how things are working versus the other way where. Uh, one might look at a computer and say, oh, no, the computer's broken because of the demons that are dancing around it because, you know, it was manufactured in a place that had a lot of demons, which makes no sense to anyone. But that's kind of what we do with the unconscious. Oh, you want to fuck your mom? You're, you're a psychotic and nervous because of all of these things that, you know, you don't actually think about it all. But now I'm going to teach you and force you into this Oedipal or representational nightmare and <laughs> explain to you how you should be thinking. And so that's that when I when they say materialist, that's how I understand it. Yeah, yeah, like like you're depressed because you listen to too much Radiohead or something like that. Yes, or uh, you're depressed because uh, you know Freud's sitting there on the couch saying you're depressed because your father did not care for you very much. It's like, well, there's probably some truth there, but that's not really like really what's going on. Like that doesn't help me. That's the idea of what a father ought to be and what my relationship ought to have been and a representation across the board. Instead, like, talk to me about what's happening now. Like, tell me about what's happening now with me. Like, please, I would like that as a, as an analysand. Like, please. Uh, uh, Michael asks, uh, uh, James asks, sorry, before you, Michael, is Deleuze trying to free unconscious desire from the Oedipal structure? Uh, uh, yes. Yes. I think that's a easy yes. Is that a yes to everyone? Easy yes? Yes. Yes. Um, or, or to say, uh, a free unconscious desire from being trapped in the Oedipal structure. Because it's free when it starts. It just doesn't stay that way. It's an interesting question. I'm not, I'm not sure on that one because... So there's some qualifications I would make there because freedom from gets into a strange place of freedom, right? Like, are we suggesting there wouldn't be structure, right? They'll talk later on about um, replacing Oedipus with Hamlet is no better, right? Moving from a patriarchy to a matriarchy is a reproduction of the same thing, yeah. So I, I think the, when they talk about like the auto critique in that, right, they're talking about, I think, you, um, they're talking about understand desire on its own terms and that and create and you're right creating lines of escape that do take us uh take desire and that allow it to flow differently from the adult structure and that but the yeah. thing is too right 
unconscious doesn't believe in Oedipus in the first place either. So it, it gets a little complicated. I think I'll, I'll just say, because Webcam Parrot phrased it best, uh, Oedipal is exemplary here. It is the, the use case that we're talking about in, this par in these paragraphs. And so in response to that, the answer is yes. It's trying, they are here talking about freeing desire from Oedipal representation. But it is not just Oedipal representation, because it's not like Oedipus invented representation. It's not that Oedipus is the only representation, as they've talked about God, the Father, all these things that sort of touch into Oedipus, but it's not just the Oedipal structure. It's this is about the Oedipal structure. They're going to get into more. Is that fair, Jack? I mean, my, my thing is more like the freedom from the, but yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. All right. Um, Michael asks, uh, the opposition between transcendental and metaphysical, I am confused about these words. And that is very fair. Who would want to take a crack at uh, a version of explaining that difference? Uh, metaphysical meaning, meta meaning, you know, alongside or, or beyond, um, meaning the, uh, the things that make up that which makes the physical possible, um, but is not itself physical would be metaphysical um and then um transcendental there's like an implication of uh, of distance of a cognitive distance or or some sort of abstract distance right a transcendent thing is not a thing happening here with me whereas an in an eminent thing is just a thing that's happening right here it's eminent it's there among us right um yeah it's it's uh transcendental uh in my understanding also has uh, built into it sort of a this was always and will always which i think metaphysics doesn't necessarily have the same its thing as a as a requirement but like transcendental anything that's transcendental assumes that it always was and always will be it's usually transcendent of time the transcendental at least in in, in the way Kant might talk about it right but it doesn't have to be Yeah, you're going to want to be careful there, too, because they're saying schizoanalysis deals with the transcendental unconscious, right? As opposed to a metaphysical unconscious. So, like, schizoanalysis mm -hmm. is doing something transcendental, which they're contrasting with something transcendent. Right. So, in this case, they are following Kant in some sort of sense, and Deleuze is um influenced influenced by him so they are not positing something like an outside uh metaphysical unconscious that is floating there like a god that is uh um, controlling all our destiny or some sort of stuff like that uh, but it's more like a formal analysis in that sort of sense uh, of a transcendental unconscious that is uh, not a contingent and individual unconscious but the necessary conditions of every unconscious that could be there without its um, specific exemplifications and expressions in a contingent historical context. Yeah, and I, I, I think the metaphysical by nature means non-physical. Like, it's, it's outside of the physical space. It's a, a super material. Like, outside, like, that's how I understood the word Transcendental doesn't necessarily, it means it exists more outside of time, but it is like a, an assumption of like an intuitive base of knowledge. A transcendental belief is a is sort of intuitive base level of understanding. Uh, I'm not sure it exists outside of time. So... Okay, analysis termed transcendental is precisely the determination of these, or the imminent, criteria. Imminent to the field of the unconscious, insofar as they are opposed to the transcendent exercises of a so-called what-does-it-mean question. Schizoanalysis is at once a transcendental and a materialist analysis. Right, so we're seeing it... Uh, the juxtaposition is between transcendent exercises of what does it mean and the transcendental um, unconscious in terms of what it does, right? So, like, this comes up even in, like, Deleuze's Pure Immanence essay where he'll talk about the transcendental 
field of the uh, of conscious well a transcendental field of consciousness encounters but the move i see them making there is it's really weird to me that they use metaphysics metaphysics there in opposition but i think what they're trying to get at in terms of just like what the function is is that when we're talking about it, uh, the transcendental unconscious and that right we're talking about taking a view of the unconscious in its self-production through imminent criteria, right? So we're looking at the conditions for the three syntheses to occur and for the unconscious to produce itself. The transcendent opposition would be the, uh, this probably will sound like an airplane pitch, but the layover, right? So the layover of what does it mean? Well, how do we talk about what does it mean? We deduce from something, right? We, d we might deduce from an edible structure what the unconscious does, but this is the point, right? We're using, we're, we're understanding the unconscious through something apart from itself, which I think is what they're getting at with figurative language even, right? Something apart from it, right, that's supposed to explain it, as opposed to looking at the, the imminent criteria or the conditions that make the syntheses possible and function uh, all together there through. That works for me. I, um, I, I think I didn't realize when Michael asked his question that we were actually going to be getting into one of the great philosophical debates of our time in conversation, but uh, I hope we answered it a little bit. Michael, did we? Oh, we got a little bit. It's okay. No, that's the whole point. <laughs> like, the, it's the, the I'm nature getting of... getting lost with, with Immanuel Kant, which is... It's a, the questions around most of the stuff inside of Anti-Oedipus, that's the reason we haven't done A Thousand Plateaus yet, we're learning this also in Logic of Sense, the stuff Deleuze is bringing up is, a, is are just thoughts that are syntheses of a lot of different thinkers, and it's all a very unique take, uh, and it does push some questions that are uh, uh, in themselves not the easiest thing to discuss, so that's the way it goes. Uh, but I will uh, continue to the next uh, paragraph. So, it's going to be a lot more of these words, so be ready for it. Thus, we have already seen how the imminent criteria of desiring production permitted a definition of legitimate uses of syntheses, uses completely distinct from Oedipal uses. And in relation to this desiring production, the Oedipal illegitimate uses seemed to us to be multiform, but always to revolve around the same error and to envelop theoretical and practical paralogisms. In the first place, a partial and nonspecific use of the connective syntheses was found to be an opposition of the Oedipal use, itself global and specific. This global-specific use was found to have two aspects, parental and conjugal, to which the triangular form of Oedipus and the reproduction of this form corresponded. This use rested upon a paralogism of extrapolation, that in fact constituted Oedipus's formal cause, an extrapolation whose illegitimate nature weighed on the whole operation. The extraction of a transcendent complete object from the signifying chain, which served as a despotic signifier on which the entire chain thereafter seemed to depend, assigning an element of lack to each position of desire, fusing desire to a law and engendering the illusion that this loosened up and freed the elements of the chain. This is the first paralogism, everyone. Uh, welcome to it. This is where things start getting a little wild. Anyone want to take a crack and start on this? So what psychoanalysis does is that they recognize an epistemic split in sexuality and knowledge, where there is there is no knowledge to be had in a certain realm of sexuality. And then they take that split and they suggest it's the split in being as well. So now what sexuality signifies is a lack in being. Whereas, uh, yeah, it doesn't seem like Deleuze and Guattari are doing any of that necessarily, but it does seem like that epistemic split is there too. And this is like that whole incompleteness thing where you can either have a system that's complete or inconsistent or vice versa. Um, but I don't think that that inconsistency, you know, it seems like such a big jump to jump 
from an epistemic inconsistency to a to a lack in being itself that is that is present so it's not that that lack is missing the lack is for psychoanalysis that lack in being is is imminent and and there is a, and there is nothing to be known about it and but it's it's imminent to language too and it can't be extricated from language like you can't separate yourself from the real in language and then stare at it and say what it is because it's like it undergirds the whole thing and this makes it to where like the real is imminently there always you can say anything anything at all and you're going to come up against like paradoxes and contradictions that aren't like stopping points that's not what they advocate for they advocate to like like keep on thinking the paradox and the contradiction and, you know, by some sort of leap of faith, you're going to find a signifier that can cover this hole and that can bring some sort of new reality to discourse or, or bring a discourse that brings a new reality. And this is like, uh, like the move for Marx was to, to talk about class struggle. Um, but yeah, that seems like a big jump to apply an epistemic inconsistency to being itself and that seems to confuse like our ability to say what a thing is with our ability to to not even recognize but that things are you know there is no guarantee that you can explain what the existence of a thing is well let's 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 try to go this down, break this down a little bit piece by piece, because they actually lay out uh, very, very clearly in here kind of how they made their steps through the claimants. Like they're, they're again, uh, it's the reason I, I like the use of materialist because it's what they're doing. So where we start is to them and the way we talk about it. Um, this is the ex extrapolation part objects paralogism, because in the first place, the connective synthesis is a partial and nonspecific use, a uh, the connective syntheses, the desiring machines don't connect to whole objects ever. They don't. They don't know what that is. Uh, they also don't connect to certain objects, specific objects. So they're partial and nonspecific. Conversely, Oedipus is itself global and specific. Well, that is the opposite. That's, that's, that's like literally the opposite. So, so what does this do? Well, what it does is it does two things as they lay out. First, it does what they call the parental and the triangular, the conjugal, or the triangular form of Oedipus, and then the reproduction of the form itself. Uh, so the, the paralogism of extrapolation that in fact constituted Oedipus's formal cause, an extrapolation whose illegitimate nature weighed on the whole operation. Uh, the extraction of a transcendent complete object from the signifying chain which served as a despotic signifier on which the entire chain thereafter seemed to depend, assigning an element of lack. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, this step, as they kind of go through this, they talk about that sort of extrapolation. It is the detachable part object becomes uh, uh, a detachable complete object that is itself not something. This all, ob all subjects lack it. Like all subjects lack it. This is... Uh, the creation of the phallus, um, although everyone lacks it in different ways, as the PDF says very nicely. Um, and I linked a PDF that explains these very crisply as well. Uh, so again, this is where the illegitimate use of the connective synthesis comes in. The other part of it, and uh, it's the PDF mentions it, and I, said, I think says it a little more clearly, um, a single term becomes detached from the chain of associations and becomes the general role of interpretant for all. Uh, what are women? Well, it's, women are because you're mommy. Mommy. All women are mommy. What are men? All men are daddy. That's it. Like this becomes the interpretant for whether or not someone is a man or a woman. By univocalizes everything. And because of that, everyone has to be a man or a woman. Because that's kind of all I can relate to things as. Um, the, the two parts of this, of extrapolation, they talk about pretty cleanly. The lack specifically that they bring in is because the, the thing we put into the chain, the, 
the thing we have placed there is not a full object. Nothing's a full object. There's no such thing as a full fucking object. It's not how it works uh, with the connective syntheses. They connect to what they connect to and only partial objects. But it extrapolates. It goes, cool. This is the, this is, oh, it must be a full object. It must be a partial object. I'm going to place that on the BWO. And it's not. It's this fucking representation. It's, in this case, Oedipus. And it gets put there. So now, which it doesn't have anything, it's not a full object, it has a lack. And now the subject does too. Because it's a detached, complete object. Yeah, it, it, but they aren't saying that the insistence of a full object isn't there. Like, and this is the third synthesis. Like, like I this feel... Is the connective synthesis is the first. Yeah, well, I'm saying this retroactive affirmation of a whole object comes after Voluptus. Um, I'm sorry. Um, but it seems like an important point that may get lost, that this stuff is still effective, and it's not secluded to Oedipus. And this is the problem of the master signifier, which I'm still trying to figure out. I mean, they, they have a they have a paralogism for it, but I don't know how it gets produced if it doesn't get produced by the unconscious. Um, because it's not like you, it's like, I imagine Marx came up with his, uh, with class struggle through some sort of, uh, you know, autopoiesis or intellectual or something, some concept like that. Um, it, it wasn't this like very strict analytic philosophy logic schematization thing. It it just it named something new. Um, I don't know. I'll come back to it. Sorry. No, no. It's we'll we'll get back to this. It's a uh, this is worth us having this other secondary discussion because I don't want to rabbit hole. Uh, which I think we will in a direction that's not in line with this. I'm just, specifically in this paragraph, though, um, this is how the connective synthesis gets misused by a global object, uh, the detachable part object into a detached complete object uh, through extrapolation. This is the first of the paralogisms. Uh, the production of a transcendental illusion. I really like that phrasing of it. Um, any questions on this one? We will get to others. There was a few of them. Five, by the way. Right? Uh, the, the next one uh, dives into uh, the disjunctive syntheses. In the second place, an inclusive or non-restrictive use of the disjunctive synthesis is in opposition to their Oedipal exclusive restrictive use. This restrictive use in its turn has two poles, imaginary and symbolic since the only choice it permits is between the exclusive symbolic differentiations and the undifferentiated imaginary, correctively determined by Oedipus. This use demonstrates this time how Oedipus proceeds. It demonstrates Oedipus's method, a paralogism of the double bind, the double impasse, or in line with the subjection made by Henri, Henri Gobard, would it be better to translate this as double hold, like a full Nelson hold in wrestling, so as to better describe the treatment forced on the unconscious when it is bound at both ends, leaving it no other choice than to respond Oedipus, to cry Oedipus in sickness as in health, in its crises as in their outcome, in its resolution as in its problem. In any case, the double bind is not the schizophrenic process. On the contrary, the double bind is Oedipus insofar as it arrests the motion of the process, or forces it to spin around in the void. <sighs> so, uh, the disjunctive synthesis, uh, again, disconnection uh, properly is inclusive and non-restrictive, the way that it works. It, it is not forced to do anything. It, it sort of Recognizes, records, does what it does, and sees things kind of as what they are as pure sensation, records those things. The illegitimate use uh, is that of what Oedipus does. Very cleanly, as they say, uh, forces people into just this like pure 
place of the imaginary or the symbolic, which forces people into that double bind, uh, the exclusive and restrictive disjunction. This is like fictive ego. I need to Google that now. Uh, if anyone has comments, go for it. I'm going to sit awkwardly until someone talks. Someone else needs to talk. All right, I, I know not everyone understood this one. Like this, if you did, you just, all of you are seriously smarter than me. This, this is one I'm, I still have a, a great deal of trouble with myself. Um, you're, you're confused? About, about what? The... So, okay, so the, the nature of the disjunctive synthesis, the second synthesis is that of disconnection and recording. Am I wrong? Yeah. It's okay. This, if the 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 a the non of the the junction, right? Yes. Um, the Oedipal would demand that it's exclusive and restrictive. You're only allowed to record or deal with a handful of things, uh, whatever. The phrasing here is where I'm having trouble. The restrictive use in, in its turn has two poles, imaginary and symbolic, since the only choice it permits is between the exclusive symbolic differentiations and the undifferentiated imaginary. Why? Like that part, I get the idea of, of things being restricted into the conception of mommy, daddy, me, forcing people into sort of biune vocalization generally. I get that idea, and it, the rest of this kind of flows, but I don't understand how... Uh, it has two poles, the restrictive use, the symbolic differentiations and the undifferentiated imaginary. What is the undifferentiated imaginary? Is this the the reference they were making earlier to the idea of if you don't become edipalized, you become nothing, and that becomes undifferentiated? Is that the reference here? I think they're talking about the Lacan's triangle, right? With the, the symbolic imaginary and the real. And the, how, how could the real be, uh, be edipalized? So it only has two poles, symbolic and imaginary, and it double binds them into a loop like that, right? So the real would be where Oedipus fails. Um, the imag I'm guessing what this undifferentiated imaginary would be, would be like the ideal ego in the mirror stage, where, um, where you look at yourself in the mirror as a baby or something, or you're gazed at by your caregivers and you notice a way in which they see you and you identify with this image. And this image uh, gives you a locus um, with which to say, you know, what you are and where you are. And there's, uh, they describe it as like a jubilation, like, ah, oh, that's me. Look how great I am. I'm this harmonious whole image. Um, but then, you know, it turns out that there's like a stain in the image or something that the image of your body can't fully consider all of the antagonisms that are going on and doesn't account for the anxiety. Um, whereas the, the symbolic. Um, and so, you know, the that's sort of the real of the images are the ways in which it fails. So whenever you look into the mirror and then things just start getting weird and you don't fully recognize yourself or like whenever, like if you ever listen to a recording of your voice and your voice just doesn't sound like your voice, that's sort of like the same concept of the imaginary. Um, and then the symbolic are the, uh, are like the rules and, and like the, the digitized rules and laws of the game per se. Um, and then the way in which the symbolic fails is at the level of formalization. So, um, so, and, and this is where you get the whole, no one has the phallus thing. So, uh, so for the masculine sexuation diagram, it's imposture. Um, uh, and whereas for the feminine sexuation diagram, it is, um, masquerade so it's like wearing a toupee versus wearing you know a skirt and, and un understood so let me ask let me ask another way because I, I get all of that from the canyon side but all of that stuff is transcendental it's a transcendental lack yep yeah so it's it's it, it or transcend yeah it's transcendent, a transcendent whatever it, yeah yes so so here's my question 
where does it fit in here? Because they're talking again about a deeply materialist system and how uh, representation and fantasy and illusion get placed into uh, desire and are sort of reforming it. The second one, I'm trying to figure out how that works. I get the idea of the double bind. I get all the words here. It's not the question of the words. It's how does it function is my question. Like the first one, again, to say very cleanly, totally get it. The idea of uh, uh, basically, hey, uh, you have to be this, or I learned what a man is, or that. I get conceptually very easy. I can apply that to like, you know, psych 101 of a, a million people. Like this shit fits. The second one, can't place it in how it actually works in my own system or any way I'm willing or able to analyze myself or think through what things I've done. I can't place it on how it actually surfaces. Like, what is the actual surfacing reality? The, the This would be my question. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit confused by the way you're asking the question, but, but maybe... This this helps. Um, I don't even remember a couple of weeks ago. I talked I talked about or we talked about how um, the body without organs is described in a very similar way to to the real in the first place, and so much of what they the what they're doing here and perhaps what they even mean by materialist is that it's happening in the real, which is why um, to them the in this you know in the schizophrenic process or whatever the odorful doesn't work. But uh, obviously, people still get pulled into it. They still get pulled pulled into the double bind, mm -hmm. and they get stuck away from the real. So, so what is the double bind? Like all of that, I'm following, and I'm totally get all that. What is the double bind? Like, what actually is it? It it it, it it's like a it's like a a, a a a trap, whatever. Like you're trapped in the middle, right? It's like a cir circular. I. I, uh, I uh, l let me ask another way. Um, uh, the idea of in the first connective syntheses, uh, I can extrapolate out the meaning of partial objects that have now become illusions because I have taken them as whole objects. That I can name examples of how that has happened to me. Probably all of us can. We can have discussions about how this happens in a like, societal level. If a person is, let's say, suffering from this paralogism. How does that suffering manifest? In the double bind? It would just be something like, you know, don't masturbate. How? Because then it predicates your desire on, on transgressing it. And it's justified at both ends, right? Yeah, yeah. If it, something good happens... If you're feeling good, it's because you didn't masturbate. If you're feeling bad, it's because you did masturbate. Yeah. So it, it's bound on both ends. So you get trapped, right? Perhaps even if you're feeling bad and you're not masturbating, it's because you haven't not masturbated for long enough, right? For instance, it's all it's always about that. Yeah, and Adi has a good uh, example. You know, this is like the. Uh the whole family dynamic at the workplace sort of thing where it's um, like, you, you don't have to visit your grandma if you don't want to, but she would really like it. Okay, so, so a way of manifesting this uh, just as, as an example, I'm not saying it's the only manifestation. I'm just trying to grok this would be uh, the way that people utilize uh, passive aggression and uh, demands on people or, to put it uh, they utilize representations that by nature sort of put a person in a position where they have no choice but to do the thing they don't want to do but also forces them to actually try to desire it and push them to like the desire of doing it it's a uh, zizek actually sorry uh, gives a gives the line it's the same one as the visit your grandma i think ati that's where i connect it with when he's talking about uh, you don't have to but it's it's even more insidious than that it's more insidious in the sense that if you don't want to is the problem. It's like, hey, do you want to visit grandma? No. Well, we need to do it anyway. It sucks. I'm sorry. That's not really that terrible. But saying, you know, if you if you loved me, you'd want you'd want to visit me. And it's like, yeah. OK, all right, cool. It's the manifesting. I should I just keep that, the manifesting of the thing. That's what I've been trying to nail. Now, that makes a lot more sense to me. Thank you. So how does why is that in the second 
of the three syntheses? Why is that in disconnection or recording? That do, feels do like... You... Sorry, go ahead, Jack. Do you mind if I cut in here? No, go, go. So you, you're missing some of the... There's terminology that'll really help you here because the second synthesis isn't just uh, disconnecting and and um, recording, right? It, it's distribution, right? So later on, they're going to call this this paralogism uh, the law of the father, right? There's a distribution of functionality of uh, of uh, Newman Newman energy to the uh, the assemblage, right? So we've seen how do you get global persons? How do you get full objects, right? It's through the detachment of a partial object so as to constitute uh, global persons in that, right? So a mother or a father is predicated on a detached partial object. So the phallus is removed from the assemblage, but now becomes what distributes uh, not only like role in that, but functionality to the assemblage. So if, if you recall, right, the second syllogism is where we start seeing the body without organs putting the connections to work to produce the surplus value. This paralogism affects that, right? Because we're talking about how the distribution of functionality in that, you know, you've almost got to have a double vision when you're talking about this. Because on one hand, the unconscious is producing through the syllogisms. But on the other hand, right there is this distribution that's effect um, that's still effective well we'll have to spend time on it another time I, i've got more questions but i think i'm i'm going to push us forward uh any any more questions on this paragraph because we've got a few more to go through uh, here pretty quick uh, in the third place a nomadic and polyvocal use of the conjunctive syntheses is opposed to the segregative and by univocal use made of them there again, this by univocal use, illegitimate from the point of view of the unconscious itself, has what appear to be two moments. First, a moment that is racist, nationalistic, religious, etc., and that, by means of a segregation, constitutes an aggregate of departure that is always presupposed by Oedipus, even if in a totally implicit fashion. Next, a familial moment that constitutes the aggregate of destination, by means of an application, would uh, by means of an application. Whence the third paralogism, the paralogism of application, which fixes the precondition for Oedipus by establishing a set of biunivocal relations between the determinations of the social field and the familial determinations, thereby making possible and inevitable the reduction of libidinal investments to the eternal daddy mommy. We still have not exhausted all the paralogisms that lead the practice of the cure in the direction of a frenzied oedipalization, a betrayal of desire, the unconscious closeted in a day nursery, a narcissistic machine for arrogant and mouthy little egos, a perpetual absorption of capitalist surplus value, flows of words against flows of money, the interminable story, psychoanalysis. Uh, there's a few that are wrapped into this one. Um, this is uh, the application uh, the from the PDF. Um, essentially, first off, uh, as they say, first, the moment is uh, racist. It places us versus them, uh, segregation of me versus other people. Uh, basically, it's a, the, as the doc says, it's a limited and fixed misidentification of uh, things and of really of yourself as well. Um, the reason they call it the application is because it, we assume that these rules apply to everything. Coming back to the idea of the schizophrenic being polyvocal, of uh, uh, being multifaceted, of, of really there not being necessarily an I or a them or having these kind of divisions, uh, this limited and fist misidentification in this third paralogism here, uh, that of the application, uh, places me against people, uh, and because of that, it places me against uh, others, me against mommy, me against daddy, uh, bio-univocalizes everything. And also, basically, as they say, it inevitably is the reduction of libidinal investments to the eternal daddy, mommy, one or the other, law or this, blah, 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 all those things. Um, is that a close understanding of this one, or am I off as well? Oddly enough, you 
when you talk about law and that you're moving back into the second um the second paralogism now what you need here is subjectivity so like affect and int intensity right fair, that's fair. what's going on here that's what's beyond the, the states are because when we're it's like ken asked how do you get the master signify right when you detach from a, sig a signifying chain right something like the phallus and that becomes what's going to represent the subject yeah that detachment is going to constitute a representation of the subject more so the orphan unconscious as they call it right because it's never it's not exactly you or i right in the traditional sense so the 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 intensities the effects that should be produced during the syllogism of uh the young uh of the body without organs right putting the um the machines to work to produce the surplus value that's then distributed in the third synthesis by the celibate machine right right so there's a little bit of different distribution there but what we're seeing now is this crossing over where in the third paralogism subjectivity itself is being um is at stake right so for instance the master signifier is the subjective or rather becomes the subject and its representation that that alone becomes what has subjectivity to say to say another way let me try um the third paralogism uh because the subject is created in the third synthesis the the conjunctive the illegitimate use of this would essentially be the creation of the myself the i against others like it presupposes that as part of the entire thing instead of sort of uh dealing with things as they are or as they come i'm uh assuming this application of everything that is not me or is me or is like me uh, it can be right because we're talking about how that gets created right so like nationalism here for for instance or like i really like the rimbo the rimbo they always quote right i'm not of your race i'm of the inferior race right this um something like nationalism or racism here it's being constructed through signifiers right and that's where the subjectivity is um is moving right instead of talking about the subjectivity that's that's in the uh the imminent sense of the body without organs and the distribution the zones the polyvocality that is being encountered in that sense we're talking about how subjectivity is instead represented in things like an American flag, right? Which becomes a signifier of subjectivity in that sense. So especially when you're dealing with something like, a, say, nationalism, right? You know, the, the American flag is the easy thing to point at because, I mean, we, in the U.S., we have that on bathing suits. We have ridiculous suits. I mean, you know, you see it everywhere because it's supposed to represent a subjectivity as a signifier. Right. And that's where you get your, your paralogistic use. All right. I'll continue to the next paragraph. That's, uh, we're probably going to go to uh, 2.30, just letting everyone know. It's another 20 minutes. I think we're going to be able to uh, make our way through the next two pages. I'd like to finish this today, so that'll be the case. The three errors concerning desire are called lack, law, and signifier. It is one and the same error, an idealism, that forms a pious conception of the unconscious, and it is futile to interpret these notions in terms of a combinative apparatus that makes of lack an empty position and no longer a deprivation, that turns the law into a rule of the game and no longer a commandment, and the signifier into a distributor and no longer a meaning. For these notions cannot be prevented from dragging their theological cortege behind, insufficiency of being, guilt, signification. Structural interpretation challenges all beliefs, rises above all images, and from the realm of the mother and the father retains only functions, defines the prohibition and the transgression as structural operations. But what water will cleanse these concepts of their background, their previous existences? Religiosity? Scientific knowledge as non-belief is truly the last refuge of belief, and as Nietzsche put it, there never was but one psychology, that of the priest. That's a great Nietzsche fucking line. It's a great line. This is when your guys' example of masturbation is a as a prohibition, actually. Right. I mean that exactly as you guys said, right? It becomes the condition for the transgression and the prohibition, right? A damned if you do, damned if you don't moment. 
but in its distribution, you know. Well, it's an interesting use of the phrasing here. So it's if they're saying like his his simple version, uh, lack becomes an empty position and no longer a deprivation, because it's assumed from the beginning we're not depriving someone of anything. It's almost like a a priori black hole that sort of just exists and never can be filled. Uh, the law turns into a rule of the game. It's just the way things are, and no longer a de uh, no longer a commandment, no longer someone ordering, no longer someone demanding, even God uh, demanding it. But instead, it's just the nature of being human, uh, and the signifier into a distributor, and no longer a meaning. Master signifier concept, maybe sort of. Oh, Ken left. Really? Um, finally, we get to a thing that I think we was talking to. Um, the idea that it, it distributes meaning but doesn't actually have meaning itself is that looks that's just directly him looking at Lacan as kind of a with a wry smile. Like I think at least that's how I take it. But this is kind of the interesting thing. I I made this point to Ken, but it, a few weeks ago. But um, the strange thing about the engagement with Lacan, right? Like they're not saying Lacan's wrong. Yeah, you know? like they're not saying the law of the father isn't real or he he missed like you know he's just full of it, right? But it's not the unconscious, is it? Right. So when we were just talking about the signifiers and that during the third synthesis, right, where subjectivity and the effects are all, they just become signifiers. Yeah. There's no expression going on there in that sense. Like that, like just like you're saying, right? That's that's Lacanian psychoanalysis, right? But that's not the production of the real that is the unconscious for Deleuze and Guattari either. With that, I think I'll move on to the next paragraph. I do love that last uh, Nietzsche line, though. Uh, scientific knowledge as non-belief is the last refuge of belief. As Nietzsche said, there never was but one psychology, that of the priest. Um, uh, the idea of having a hierarchical system that determines uh, how you believe and how you think about things, uh, Nietzsche sort of traced right back to the idea of belief itself and, and religiosity. That's how I, I take that quote and have always have that just by having that sort of attachment to belief, you've placed yourself in that spot of essentially religious belief of its own sort. So what am I saying? This is the, the comment I was making earlier, like it, a modern atheism is not like the same. It's not like the idea of, oh, I just don't believe. It's like, I don't believe in God, like as a claim, like it's like a thing and it's it's against a thing it's a in high school uh there's the joke of the kids who didn't want to be like the cool kids so they did literally the opposite of whatever the cool kids did to show that they don't care like it's i'm proven that i don't care about what you think by doing literally the opposite and paying so much attention to you think that i'm doing the opposite of whatever you say it's like it's like that i guess anti-theists and theists have that in common that is my understanding and interpretation. Anyone else wants to jump in, you're welcome to. I'm about to dive in, so you got two seconds to come off mute and say a thing. I kind of like that, because in, in how you explained it, you can see a distribution going to the theist and the anti-theist, right? There's a, it's the same condition, but also the same like distribution. Yes, it's a, the capitalist and the anti-capitalist as well, but I, I'll leave that for a, another time. Um. From the moment lack is reintroduced into desire, all of desiring production is crushed, reduced to being no more than the production of fantasy. But the sign does not produce fantasies. It is a production of the real and a position of desire within reality. From the moment desire is welded again to the law, we needn't point out what is known since time began, there is no desire without law, the eternal operation of eternal repression recommences, the operation that closes around the unconscious, the circle of prohibition and transgression, white mass and black mass. But the sign of desire is never a sign of the law. It is a sign of strength. And who would dare use the term law for the fact that desire situates and develops its strength, and that whatever it is, it causes flows to move and substances to be intersected? I am careful not to speak of chemical laws. The word has a moral aftertaste. From the moment desire is made to depend on the signifier, it is put back under the yoke of a despotism whose effect is castration. There, where one recognizes the stroke of the signifier itself, 
but the sign of desire is never signifying. It exists in the thousands of productive breaks flows that never allow themselves to be signified within the unary stroke of castration. It is always a point sign of many dimensions, polyvocity as the basis for a punctual semiology. So it's a huge takedown of lack as a conception. Does anyone want to jump in and add a few notes to it? Because there's a lot happening here. Um, this is them expanding on the previous few sentences where they basically go through uh, lack, they go through law, and they go through signification. This is just them extrapolating out those things and explaining them a little bit better. Uh, the moment lack is reintroduced, all of desiring production gets crushed because uh, the sign does not produce fantasies. It is a production of the real in a position of desire within reality. And then, from the moment desire becomes welded again to the law, uh, the eternal operation of eternal repression recommences. Uh, again, once we've married these things to the law, suddenly the law is there to tell us not what to believe. Now I understand this second paralogism, thank all of you. Uh, it, we have been told the law implicitly, and therefore we also know what we truly want, but we also know we can't want that, and now, oh fuck, this sucks, is kind of how that goes. Um, the final being uh, signification at the very end. This is where one recognizes the stroke of the signifier. Sign of desire is never signifying. It exists in the thousands of productive breaks flows that never allow themselves to be signified within a unary stroke of castration. It's always a point sign of many dimensions. Uh, the idea that signification is not uh, uh, dependent on the signifier, but the signifier makes desire dependent upon it by how it operates. A lot of quiet people today. It's nice. Uh, I need the solitude. I was worried I was going to have a lot of raucous fucking people on this stream, so that's kind of nice. Is that why you called the pizza guy earlier? Yeah, exactly. I needed Dottie to make some noise a little bit. Break up the monotony. Uh, or I'm not saying anything that's wrong, which is great for me. So I'm just going to continue to uh, the next paragraph. And does anyone have questions so far? It is said that the unconscious is dark and somber. Reich and Marcuse are often reproached for their Rousseauism, their naturalism, a conception of the unconscious that is thought to be too idyllic. But doesn't one indeed lend to the unconscious horrors that could only be those of, of consciousness and of a belief too sure of itself? Would it be an exaggeration to say that in the unconscious there is necessarily less cruelty and terror? and of a different type than in the consciousness of an heir, a soldier, or a chief of state. The unconscious has its horrors, but they are not anthropomorphic. It is not the slumber of reason that engenders monsters, but vigilant and insomniac rationality. The unconscious is Rousseauistic, being man-nature. And how much malice and ruse there are in Rousseau, transgression, guilt, castration, are these determinations of the unconscious, or is this the way a priest sees things? Doubtless there are many other forces besides psychoanalysis for oedipalizing the unconscious, render rendering it guilty, castrating it. But psychoanalysis reinforces the movement. It invents a last priest. Oedipal analysis imposes a transcendent use on all the syntheses of the unconscious, ensuring their conversion. The practical problem of schizoanalysis is, then, to ensure the contrasting reversion, restoring the syntheses of the unconscious to their imminent use, de-edipalizing, undoing the daddy-mommy spiderweb, undoing the beliefs so as to attain the production of desiring machines, and to reach the level of economic and social investments where the militant analysis comes into play. Nothing is accomplished so long as machines are not touched upon. This implies interventions that are in fact very concrete, in place of the benevolent pseudo-neutrality of the Oedipal analyst, who wants to, who wants and understands only daddy and mommy. We must substitute a malevolent, an openly malevolent activity. Your Oedipus is a fucking drag. Keep it up and the analysis will be stopped, or else we'll apply a shock treatment to you. Stop saying daddy mommy. Of course Hamlet lives in you as Werther lives in you, and Oedipus too, and anything you want. But you grow uterine arms and legs, uterine lips, uterine mustache. 
In tracing back the memory deaths, your ego becomes a sort of mineral theorem, which constantly proves the futility of living. Were you born Hamlet, or did you not rather create the type in yourself? Whether this be so or not, what seems infinitely more important is, why revert to myth? It's a great paragraph, too. I was so, so loving going through this. They, they say fucking a lot. Uh, I think fuck is actually like the 20th word in the entire book. Uh, they start early. But uh, I think they were here being a bit on the uh, direct side, where it's uh, talking to psycho psychoanalysts. I want to say, like, usually this stuff is, uh, I think, glottery. This one, I think, Deleuze, like, uh, spiced up a little bit before. Um, Oedipus is a fucking drag. Keep it up. Analysis will be stopped. We need to actually go after them and say, no, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. Stop it. Why, why do we need to revert to myth at all when we're asking, were you born Hamlet or did you not rather create the ham type in yourself? That's fuck that. It's, it, why revert to myth at all? Let's talk about why you are what you are. Yeah, I mean, they do the same thing with, uh, with anal as well, don't they? And analysis. So great. To make fun of uh, the old psychoanalysis, the old, especially Freud. Especially Freud, for sure. I do want to know where the quote is from. I have, I, I have the PDF somewhere. Uh, the whole thing that this quote is taken from is great. I just remember that. Uh, to read the last paragraph, and then we'll uh, ask, have questions and discussion. Uh, if myth is given up, a little joy, a little discovery, is restored to psychoanalysis. For it has become very dismal, very sad quite interminable, with everything decided in advance. Will it be retorted that the schizo is not joyous either? But doesn't his sadness come from the fact that he can no longer bear the forces of oedipalization and hamletization that uh, hem him in on all sides? Better to flee to the body without organs, and hide there, closing himself up in it. The little joy lies in schizophrenization as a process, not in the schizo as a clinical entity. You have pushed a process into a goal. If we made a psychoanalyst enter into the domains of the productive unconscious, he would feel as out of place with his theater as an actress from the Comédie Française in a factory, a priest from the Middle Ages on an assembly line. We must set up units of production, plug in desiring machines. What takes place in this factory, what this process is, its spasms and its glories, its labors and its joys still remain unknown. And I will say once again, as I always do, uh, just the line here, little joy lies in schizophrenization as a process, not in the schizo as a clinical identity. Do not tell people to become a schizo. Do not tell people that's what we want. We're talking about the process. Stop doing that. Anyone who happens to be listening, you know who you are. I do like this last bit, though. Uh, any questions on this section? Anything going on? Any thoughts anyone has? Uh, Boskard says, uh, it's moments like this that they actually mention what the project wants to do that makes me wonder why they considered it a failure. Uh, Deleuze shit on all of his books after they came out. I, he has very few books that I don't think he considered a mistake at one point or another. Uh, I think Guattari is less apt to do that, but suffers from it as well. Uh, uh, Deleuze once said logic of sense was a mistake to write at all, which is... Uh, insane. Like, he, he didn't like his other, like, it's the nature of a lot of what they talk about. So, they just kind of shit on their own stuff a lot. I actually think a, a great deal of this is pointing towards a, maybe something that wasn't realized in their lifetime, but an idea and a process that we can continue to push forward. Because that's the idea. So, does everyone here understand the syntheses, how they operate at a material level, and then how they can be misused through the paralogisms to actually create these large-scale illusions and the, the, the representations that we so, so participate in and that actually sort of come back to control our desire and affect us. I mean, I have other questions that we're going to get to, not on this stream, but at some point soon we'll be doing that. But please, if you have any questions, now's the time. All right, well, with that, I think we're going to close out. I uh, 
thought I'd leave it open for a minute, see if there was any questions. We did not get any. Uh, uh, feel free to continue to join us in uh, the overall discussions, everything that's happening. Uh, we would love to have you join us uh, just in general. So uh, be keeping an eye on things and thank all of you so very much for joining us. <laughs>